Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Pam stared spellbound at her reflection in the mirror. In its mysterious depths was reflected a girl of fabulous beauty, as if descended from the paintings of the old masters. Soft porcelain skin, huge blue eyes surrounded by lancet lashes that never knew makeup. Puffy pink lips, perfectly shaped, high breasts, thin waist, and a cloud of snow-white lace. How she dreamed she would have it all. A wedding dress, a princess-worthy veil, a modest-looking string of natural pearls, and a ring. The dream of any girl, no matter how independent they might pretend to be. Nonsense. Any of us sleeps and sees how that same Prince Charming kneels, gently puts a ring on her slender finger. However, she had no idea how much such a diamond ring could cost, for she had never had the chance to wear such jewelry before. And Alex could afford such a fancy ring and many other things. He could afford anything he wanted. For example, this kind of bliss, to choose her Pam the most ordinary girl from a simple family with extremely average income. Out of hundreds of much better options, surely in his circle such adultery was frowned upon. But Alex, with his millions, didn't give a damn about any opinion but his own. He took what he wanted without regard to obstacles, and he certainly didn't care what anyone else thought. That's how he wanted Pam. And he got her. Though he was neither beautiful nor a prince, Pam took another close look at herself in the mirror and pictured the formidable figure of Alex beside her. The balding, perhaps overly obese 40-year-old man looked even older than his years. But that didn't matter now. But what strength and power did he reek of? How steady was his arm? No, he was not a prince. He was a true king. And the title had not come to him at the negotiating table. Pam fixed her veil and gazed at her own reflection. She thought about it, remembering from the beginning the history of her acquaintance with this strange and even frightening man. She did not want to go to the restaurant with the girls then, rebelled as best she could, but her friend said she would be very offended if Pam did not go immediately to celebrate her birthday. Twenty years was a big date. How can you not have a bachelorette party? I booked a stripper. Imagine, Lily's classmate and friend Pam chattered with excited eyes. Lily, why would you want a stripper? Pam laughed, trying to think of a convincing reason not to. She didn't like that kind of entertainment. Restaurants were definitely out of her price range. And as for the striptease, it was embarrassing. Oliver wouldn't approve. What do you know? Laughed Lily. Tell me where else to look at handsome men in the movies and at striptease. No, she didn't, Pam said. But then a third friend joined in. It's good for you. You have Oliver. She declared with obvious envy. You've got a great guy, so at least let the rest of us look at other people's faces. Or you could call yours and have him take a leave of absence and dance for us. Oh no, Pam laughed and gave up. For after all, what's she got to lose? She'll sit down and have a nice meal. And then she'll go quietly. And she doesn't have to look at other people's men. Let Lily fool around if she has extra money. Lily was indeed the daughter of well-to-do parents. Pam had borrowed a thousand more than once from her. If she didn't have enough for a scholarship, she was too shy to ask her parents for money. They didn't have much of an income. They could barely make ends meet. They offered, of course, more than once. But Pam stood her ground. She had enough money. I got a part-time job. She didn't mention the fact that it was a penny-pinching job. Of course. So you're coming with us. Lily clarified, backing her into a corner. Okay, I'll go. Pam waved her hand. Do you want me to get you that cornflower dress? Lily said happily. Pam thought about it. Lily did indeed have a delightful dress of a striking shade that was unusually suited to her eyes. True, it was short and had a rather plunging neckline. But it was her birthday, and she won't even dance. Just sit at the table. Okay, she gave in and her friend shrieked with delight, and started kissing the struggling Pam on both cheeks. The closer the evening got, the less Pam wanted to go to the restaurant. A feeling of foreboding kept haunting her. She didn't tell Oliver where she was going, she just wrote that they would celebrate the birthday of a classmate. 
The time, however, was approaching irresistibly close to the appointed hour. And Pam, waving goodbye to doubt, put on the same dress, heeled shoes. She added a silver chain, and she marveled at how beautiful she looked to herself at that moment. As she spun around the room, Pam was dreaming. She wished Oliver could see her like this, but she'd sense enough to know that he'd be asking her if it was a baccalaureate party, if the cleavage on her dress was too revealing, and so on, and so forth. I'm not going to report to anyone. Suddenly, the girl was offended. When she becomes a husband, and let him tell me what to wear, and then I shall think whether I ought to obey him. I'm a free man. I have nothing to do with housekeeping. She went to the restaurant, having spent a fortune on a cab. In the car, she had to cover her knees, her purse, so that the driver was more looking at the road, not distracted by her feet. They looked seductively out from under her short puffer. Girl, leave your phone number. The hot Caucasian couldn't take it, taking her to her destination. I'll give a miracle of the moon and back just a beckoning finger. Laughing, Pam paid the bill and slipped out of the car. The girls were already waiting at the entrance. They were joined by two other girls Pam didn't know. Apparently, they were friends of Lily's from another department. The merry flock clicked their heels into the hall, where the maitre d', majestic as an iceberg, ushered them into a cozy corner separated from the rest of the room. The girls sank down on the comfy couches, stretched their legs with pleasure, and talked excitedly, exchanging impressions. Lily looked simply beautiful in her new tight-fitting dress, accentuating her great figure. She was a bit of a fish in water, that's for sure. Going to restaurants was a regular thing for her, winningly looking around at the girls and accepting gifts and congratulations. Lily ordered for everyone, carefully sipping wine from a tall glass. Pam finally allowed herself to relax and enjoy the delightful bouquet of expensive drink, pleasant music, the overall chick atmosphere. I wish we could spend every night like this, she dreamed, or at least every weekend. She imagined walking into the restaurant with Oliver on his arm, dressed in a fancy suit. How that haughty maitre d' bowed to them, choosing the best seats. It's a pity it's only a dream. When Oliver gets out of the service, comes home, finds a good money job, then there will be restaurants, and everything will be fine. In the meantime, we have to wait. So she waits. There's not much left. Oliver will be back in the spring. Maybe he'll propose, because that's where it's headed. He hinted at it when Pam came to him for her swearing in. And now every time they call each other, he calls her his favorite and dearest. Pam, what are you dreaming about? Lily called out to her, bringing her back to reality. You don't eat anything. Taste it, it's good, it's very good. Pam, struggling to come back to reality, nodded and poked something incredibly tasty on her fork. Everyone stay where you are, this is the police. There was a sudden, authoritative voice, and she almost choked. A real cop from an action movie was standing in front of them, playing with his handcuffs, a tall blonde man, in a perfectly fitting uniform, glanced around them and suddenly tossed his cap in Lily's lap. The girl shrieked and clapped her hands. He wasn't a real cop, he was a stripper, Pam guessed. To confirm her guess, the cop began unbuttoning his uniform. His cap was followed by his holster. The guy moved gracefully to the music, gradually exposing his beautifully built body. Get out of here, a voice bellowed and two men with the look of typical criminal burst into their corner, which has ceased to be a cozy place. Glaring at the squeezed girls, they laughed. Did the girls want to look at the naked men? So it was us all at once. And no need to pay. We'll give the money ourselves. And that was followed by an unprintable word. So it was nowhere near here. The unfortunate stripper, having received a heavy kick, picked up the props and disappeared. I'm glad I got off cheap. The brothers, considering the matter resolved, sat down at their table, making the girls snuggle up to each other. What are we celebrating? One of them asked, it's my birthday. Lively made a timid noise. He gave her a cool, cynical look and nodded approvingly. A holiday then, that's good. 
Next we pay. Only it's not booze, it sucks. Hey, bring some vodka. This was directed at the terrified waiters. They'd brought out a couple of decanters full of vodka in a second. They'd made the table full of vodka. What's with the chicks? The second winked and pinched the girl closest to him on the breast. She owed and blushed. The man laughed. Well, let's drink to the name day. The one with the gold teeth suggested. The waiter obeyed the order and quickly poured the vodka into glasses. I don't drink vodka. Pam spoke up. She was very frightened. But her insides were seething with resentment and anger at having ruined the party. Look at the brave one. Goldtooth marveled. She's a real character. I like her. You can have a drink with us. He put the glass to the girl's lips. She pressed her lips and shook her head. Drink. Who did you say? The bandit barked, pulling out his gun. The girl screamed, trembling with fear. I will not. It was like a demon had got into Pam. What's the matter with you? We're not in the 90s, and she's not a quivering beast to be told what to do by some jerk. Leave the girl alone. There was a low voice. Before she knew it, two other broad-shouldered men had appeared. They just reeked of strength and confidence in their obedience. Fuck you. The gold-toothed man started to chortle, but the other leaned over and whispered something in his ear. Pam heard only one word, or rather, the name Bagrov. Before my eyes, the bandit changed his face and swore through his teeth. He put his weapon away, nodded to his partner, and both quickly got up and disappeared from sight. You can continue to have fun. You will not be disturbed. Calmly, one of the men said, but the party had already been ruined. They stalked off, not making eye contact. Pam wanted to cry, and was glad that Oliver would never know. The girl was making her way toward the exit, maneuvering between tables when she was blocked. Looking up, Pam recognized one of the saviors, young lady, the man said with a suave manner which was hardly in keeping with his typical jock exterior. I have been authorized to give you an invitation from a very respectable man who believes that it is not just an obligation to make amends for the offense caused to you by a rabble that has no place in a decent restaurant. Thank you. I'm fine. You don't have to make it up to me. Can I just go home? Pam looked around, but her friends were already out of sight. She felt trapped, though the man barely touched her arm. He must have given someone a sign and gotten an answer for he smiled and continued. Let me at least make sure you get home safely. Without letting her object, the man said something quietly to the waiter and led Pam to the exit. The cab appeared in an instant, as if by magic. A minute later, a well-traveled waiter handed an astounded Pam a huge bouquet of flowers. A bewildered girl accepted it, and a wildly concentrated and visibly frightened cab driver drove her home without charging a penny. Pam thought she saw a black car pull up outside her house and then drive away in the restaurant parking lot. Or maybe it was just her wildest imagination. It wasn't until she entered her one-room apartment, closed the door, and leaned back against it to calm her racing heart. Pam calmed down a little, put the flowers in a vase, involuntarily admiring the beauty of the gorgeous bouquet. And then the cell phone rang. Pam almost jumped, but answered it. When she saw the number pop up, it was Lily. Pam, where did you go? You were coming to get us. We were worried. Lily's voice sounded genuinely worried. Pam felt guilty. Of course she should have told her it was all right, but the series of events had just thrown her off balance. Sorry, Lily, I got distracted. The guy who stood up for us saw me off and gave me flowers. He gave me an apology from someone serious. Pam said, looking thoughtfully at the bouquet. Something made Lily's voice ring with excitement. I heard the bandit talking about Bagrov. It turns out that his bodyguard stood up for us. Can you imagine? Who's that? Pam seemed to gasp at the stupidity of her question. Pam, why have you fallen from the moon? Well, Bagrov is the master of the city. In fact, he owns everything here. And that restaurant is also his. Lily just burst out. Apparently, the girl had already recovered from her fright. 
What had happened must have seemed like an interesting adventure. Wait, you said flowers and an apology. Interesting. Why is this for you? Actually, it was my birthday. Pam got a hint of jealousy in her friend's voice. Lily, how much does she love to be first in everything? I'm sure it's for all of us, she assured her friend. I'll bring you the bouquet tomorrow, and you can have it. I will, Lily laughed. I called my parents. They're organizing a family dinner for me so fun and no striptease. But there will be gifts and flowers. Happy birthday again. Pam put down her cell phone and went to make coffee. Looking at the rising foam in the brew, she went over the events of the evening in her memory. And with each passing minute it was becoming more and more disturbing. She had to get mixed up in this story with the bandits. They were all bandits, and Bagrov could do worse than that too. Oh, how inopportune this all is. Soothing herself, Pam texted Oliver, I love you. Good night. Let him read it and smile. I wish these two months would fly by. When Oliver comes back, everything will fall into place. There will be no need to be afraid of anyone. Everything will change. Maybe even the last name. Coffee and a good book brightened up her evening. So that gradually she forgot all about the unsuccessful trip to the restaurant after all. Well made that same Bagra beautiful gesture of sending his bodyguards to deal with criminals, showed them whose shoes are in the house. So that's the end of it. She was wrong. It didn't, because that morning she was accosted by the driver of a foreign car, the most gangster looking of all. Pam, good morning. I've been told to take you to class and anywhere else you need to go. It's a gift from Alex Bogrov. I'm sorry, I don't know what to call you, Pam. Andrew, the driver introduced himself. So, Andrew, continued the girl, Please tell your Alex that I really appreciate his care, but I don't need it at all. I'm fine. Nobody's going to come after me. Pam. Andrew shook his head with the smile with which adults look at an unintelligent child. You must understand two simple things. One, you can't know for sure that the freaks of yesterday won't want to avenge one of your humiliation and in public. And two, my master's gifts are not to be refused. It was said with such intonation that Pam flinched. What a mess. And she believed the story was over. Should not have gone to that restaurant. I mean, how could you tell? Pam was not stupid. So with her head held high, she stepped into the car. Okay. I'm really in a hurry to get to the Institute. I'd appreciate a ride, she said in the tone of a queen. Andrew whistled admiringly and held up his thumb in anticipation of her reaction but his behavior was impeccable. He did not try to talk or flirt along the way, and he got to the institute in a jiffy. What time do classes end? He asked. When Pam got out of the car, I'll pick you up. At four, Pam quickly replied, figuring that she could escape from the intrusive service much earlier. Don't do anything stupid, I wouldn't advise it. Andrew warned her, as if reading her mind consider it as friendly advice. Pam's heart skipped a beat, though he'd said it calmly, unthreateningly. Studying didn't go to her head in her classes. She kept glancing up and down at her watch, so the teacher even admonished her. And attentive Lily wrote, Why are you fidgeting? Is there a problem? It's okay, lied Pam, deciding to herself. What should she do to get away from Andrew, or be a good girl and obey? After all, he wasn't offering her anything bad at least not yet. However, the freedom-loving nature of the girl rebelled against such arbitrariness. What's the matter with her? She is not a thing to be decided for her when she leaves and how she gets home. It's her life. At 3.30, barely out of class, she slipped quietly outside. With a mental giggle, she fooled the intrusive bodyguard. What did you get out early? A tone sounded in her ear. Pam almost jumped and turned around abruptly. Standing two paces away from her, grinning, was Andrew. That's where he'd come from. Out of the ground or something. Without a word, the driver grabbed her firmly by the elbow and led her toward the car. Pam jerked once, twice, to no avail. Her arm felt like it was caught in a trap. I'll scream, she warned. 
Andrew smirked, shouting. Just look here first. Andrew's hand dived into his pocket. Pam glanced involuntarily at what he was now holding out to her. It was an FSB officer's ID card. Fake. For what? The girl clarified. Offending. Andrew sighed. We all have the real thing. So, shall we shout, or go home? Pam smiled against her will. The man spoke in the most peaceful tone, and did not offer anything criminal. Let's go home. She gave up. Andrew drove her home in a few minutes, and when she got out, he began unloading brand name bags from the trunk without any explanation. He followed a surprised Pam. The girl thought how she could manage to keep him out of the apartment, but immediately realized the futility of the idea herself. Andrew took off his shoes in the hallway and made his way to the kitchen. Pam suddenly felt ashamed of the squalor of the environment in which she lived, but the man remained silent, deliberately stuffing food into the refrigerator. What's that for? Don't. The girl protested weakly. It wasn't my initiative. Alex told me to provide the food. Calmly answered Andrew. I'll pick you up tomorrow morning. And putting on his shoes again, he finally disappeared out the door. Pam sat down on a stool, staring at the refrigerator, then pulled out her cell phone and typed in the internet search lines. Alex Bogrov, a strong-willed face stared back at her, a confident man. There wasn't much information, but it was becoming clear. Here he was, the master of the city, able to buy whatever he wanted. And you can't buy me. Pam flicked her tongue at the picture of Bagrov. After thinking about it, she got up and opened the fridge to throw everything out. But the idea struck her as childish, and all this splendor smelled amazing. After a moment's hesitation, Pam set about making herself a regal meal. It went on for a week. Andrew drove her to the institute and brought her back, periodically restocking. One day, when she returned home, Pam found that the leaky faucet had been replaced and there was a brand new toilet in the tiny unit. The girl gasped with indignation and in the morning told Andrew everything. He listened with a nonchalant look, then stopped the car and turned to her. Pam squirmed in her seat, expecting anything. Pam. Amicably, Andrew began. Understand a simple thing you liked a very powerful man who knows what he wants and is used to get his way. Believe me, a thousand young girls would come running themselves if he flicked his finger. But now he's acting like I've never seen him act before. I don't know why, but you got him hooked. So take a friendly piece of advice. Don't get cocky and accept gifts with gusto. Did somebody ask me? Pam got angry, not even noticing that Andrew switched to you. I have a fiancé, by the way, he's coming back from the army, and we're going to get married. And you'll live in such poverty. Andrew shook his head. Do you think that your Oliver can find a job in the city if Bagrov does not want it? Did everyone find out? Yes, Pam clenched her fists. Andrew nodded seriously. Of course he did. Pam opened her mouth, closed it. There was essentially nothing to say. Pam, he's not a bad man. Andrew added, after a silence. Not a saint, of course. Where there is a lot of money, there are no saints. But he's fair in his own way and very lonely. He lost his wife about ten years ago. He hasn't been in a serious relationship since. Just girls for the night. Pam, realizing that if Bogrov had wanted it, she could have met the same fate. What happened to his wife? She asked not knowing why she was being curious. She died. Cancer could not save her. Andrew answered briefly. No money helped. Since then, he withdrew and went into business. No kids, lives only for himself, and I have nothing to do with it, pleaded Pam. I would have lived quietly, and I would have gone on living. It's not like I ask you to save me. Silly. With a condescending tone of an older brother, Andrew replied. You have no idea. Who were those bastards that came up to you? They were totally scumbags. And no morals. Believe me, without our intervention, it could have ended very, very badly. What does he save everyone in trouble with your Bogrov? Pam snarled. Did you really have nothing to say to her? 
No, of course not. But I do know he laid eyes on you from the first minute he came in. And then he kept looking in your direction. Maybe not me. Pam tried to resist. Lily is much prettier and all. You bet she is. Andrew smiled. You really stood out from the girls. It was awkward for you. She was always trying to pull my leg. And you have the most extraordinary eyes you could imagine. Pam blushed at this unexpected confession. She was still very uncomfortable. She had the most improbable plans in her head. How to get rid of the attention of this bagruff. Let's go, amicably suggested Andrew. Pam nodded, getting up. For tomorrow, do not plan anything, he added. You are invited to the theater. The dress is ready. Refusal is not accepted. Now Pam erupted in indignation. She is not a toy. Andrew shook his head. I read about the taming of the shrew. Pam against her will nodded. Well, that's what the play is called. Andrew grinned. Our Alex is a man, not without humor. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Left alone at last, Pam slumped on the bed. What to do? Leave town. Write to Oliver? Go to the police. One option was stupider than the other. So she acted purely feminine from the heart. She cried, then washed her face and tried on the dress Andrew had left her. The outfit was made to measure and suited her incredibly. Pam was transformed. Now she could be mistaken for a real movie star and at the Academy Awards. Here and go to the theater by herself, Pam announced with sparkling eyes and talk at last with the purple. Let him know that not everything is bought and sold in this life. The next evening, extremely determined, insanely beautiful in an evening gown with a purse and heels. Pam was waiting for Andrew, opening the front door of the car. He even hovered in admiration. It was nice, though she did not admit it to herself. All the way, the girl's heart pounded in anticipation of meeting the unknown purple man. Even if he was all tough, he had no right to be. Here was the problem, which has no right to protect and woo. And very nicely, send flowers and groceries should have immediately refused, and to set the record straight. In addition, Pam caught herself thinking that this kind of attention is even flattering. All right, today would be settled. She'd explained to the man that she had a fiancé, that she was responsible for her own life. It's not like Bagrov is going to kill her for refusing, really. At that moment the car stopped. The door swung open on Pam. She smelled the magical scent of expensive toilet water. And someone reached out to help her out. Another moment, and she found herself face to face with the very Alex Bagrov. A conversation with whom she had just rehearsed. Good evening. Pam, you're charming, I dare say. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. His voice was warm and velvet. He still held her hand in his. Pam looked at Bagrov in silence. Words flowed from her tongue in his presence. She felt almost hypnotized. In addition, in fact the owner of the city was not at all like the picture on the internet taller, not as fat, though prone to corpulence. However, the muscularity was evident even under the perfectly tailored suit, apparently. Alex was not always an entrepreneur. And now both stood and looked at each other, as if assessing the opponent in a duel. Bagrov, thinking his guest embarrassed and frightened, spoke again. Pam, you're trembling all over. Do I really scare you so much? I don't understand. All the harsh words she was thinking up evaporated. He overwhelmed her with his willpower of self-confidence. And now Pam really was as timid as a schoolgirl in front of the headmaster. Why you? Why me? Bagrov smiled his cold and haughty face immediately transformed in the most incredible way. Now it was almost beautiful, charming. Undoubtedly, Alex threw up his hands. I liked you back there in the restaurant. You had no idea how much you looked out of place, despite your dress which made you look a little self-conscious. You also desperately didn't want to be in that restaurant. You don't go to many places like that. Pam nodded, feeling like a rabbit in front of a bow constrictor. You interested me. And of course, I could not allow you to be offended in my restaurant. Softly continued Bagrov. In yours. Through his head Pam, who decided to go on the offensive. 
It's all yours, right? And you decided. No need to say unnecessary words. Bagrov made. Cautionary gesture with his palm. Yes, it so happens that I control a lot of things in this city, and a lot of things I own. But this does not mean that I'm trying to buy your attention or put pressure on you. An invitation to the theater is an excuse to get to know each other personally. You like Shakespeare, don't you? I am. Aren't you? With a challenge, Pam asked. Bagrov shrugged his shoulders. And I, too, at one time read the entire works. Many in the original watched the productions in various famous theaters, and not only domestic. If you want, you can arrange an exam. He smiled, looking at the open mouth. Pam believed it. So confident did his voice sound. The staging turned out great. Pam laughed to tears at the witty lines. She was finally able to relax and immerse herself in the fabulous world of theater. What's more, watching from the VIP box was far more enjoyable than watching from behind the heads of the other couples in the audience. They were served champagne and fruit and candy. The girl enjoyed the feeling of comfort. Bagrov's remarks, which were always to the point and extremely graceful. Yes, she felt very good. Now all the negativity she had been feeling all this week was gone, and she was her cheerful, open, and trusting self again. They watched the play in one breath as the performers took the stage. To the applause of the audience, they handed them sumptuous bouquets, glancing at Alex out of the corner of their eyes. Pam understood these signs of attention more from him, something that made her feel very good, as if the flowers received herself as if reading her thoughts in the box brought a bouquet. This is for you, Pam. For a wonderful evening that you gave me, believe me, I did not rest so long," said Bagrov, before she had time to object. Leaning down, he respectfully kissed her hand. Pam flashed. The thought raced through her head. What's going to happen next? He was bound to ask for more. And again she was wrong, because Bagrov took her to the car and once again thanked him. How was it? He didn't need you. He chuckled good-naturedly, Andrew. Pam absent-mindedly shook her head, looking out the window. Yes, she was expecting something else, something more terribly intrusive. And Bagrov turned out to be a normal man. He turned out to be educated, courteous, not at all like that Barmely, the image of whom she had invented. And she was very calm, and good next to him. Pam forbade herself to think about it. Once she went to the theater, and that was it. Next time, she would tell him everything. So you are sure there will be a next time? She asked herself. Andrew watched her through the mirror, did not bother with questions, apparently understanding the emotional turmoil of the girl. Once home, Pam regretfully changed her clothes, lamenting that she hadn't asked how to return the dress. On reflection, she decided that for such a question she would simply be laughed at. Not finding her place, she decided to call Oliver. The conversation left a strange residue. Oliver seemed to her somehow embittered. He spoke reluctantly. He didn't ask how she was doing, and she longed for sweet words, proof of his love. Pam hung up, blubbering. Why was it so? Why did Oliver withdrew into himself now, when she so needed his help? And what if this misunderstanding continued to arise after the wedding? Had she been hasty in her decision to marry this handsome, but at times incomprehensible guy? And he hadn't offered her anything of the sort. And then the cell phone rang again. Pam grabbed the phone, sure that it was Oliver who realized that he had offended her by neglect and was now calling back. However, the number was unfamiliar. After hesitating, she accepted the video call Pagrov was looking at her. Pam flinched, almost throwing the phone away. I'm sorry. I thought you seemed to be sad about something right now, so I wanted to make sure everything was okay. I guess my intuition was right, he said in a sad tone. Pam was silent, tears trickling down her cheeks. Pam, do you like motorcycles? Bagrov asked. The question was so unexpected that she nodded then change into jeans and a jacket and go downstairs," said her companion in a tone that could not tolerate objections, and passed out. Here we go again, Pam thought.
but she was curious as to what he was up to. She could always cry, she thought. She went downstairs, changed quickly, and looked around. There was a sound at the end of the street, the soft snarl of a powerful engine. And it was getting closer, and after another minute, a motorcyclist pulled up beside her. Pam didn't know anything about machinery, but it was definitely something very, very sophisticated. Alex Bagrov, and it was undoubtedly him, lifted the glass on his helmet and shoved the other into Pam's hands. Sit down. She put on the helmet strap, stepped, settled, behind, hesitated to put her arm around the motorcyclist's waist, and they went. Pam felt horror at first, which was immediately replaced by a delight in the speed of a reliable car and something else makes sweetly swooning heart. They raced through the city, outrunning the occasional car, out of the city, and onward. So much so that the asphalt merged into one solid line. Pam shouted something. Bagrov answered her with the same shriek of joy, and they both must have looked like two madmen who had decided to end their lives this way. But it was just the opposite. She had never felt so alive. And she wished this flight would never end. The asphalt changed to a bumpy road, and the driver slowed down, and then the motorcycle took them to the river, wide and unhurried. Bagrov shut off the engine, put his foot down, giving Pam a chance to get off, and they sat together for a long time, propped up on his jacket and silent. All words seemed superfluous. There was only the sky, the river, and them pensive. Not long ago, they knew nothing of each other. Feeling that Pan was beginning to freeze, Bagrov embraced her, warming her with his warmth. She did not pull away, just froze, listening to her own feelings. Half an hour later, reluctantly removing her hand, Alex Temofevich stood up and held out his hand to her, rising from his jacket, and again there was flight. Only now to the elation intervened something else fuzzy, warm, like the first fluffy willows. Now I see that all is well, said her Bagrov. Goodbye, don't cry anymore, or I won't be able to sleep. Then he got on his great bike and drove away. And Pam stood there for a minute, looking after him. Is this the scary Bagrov? Without bodyguards in jeans and a leather jacket, it was him she had recently embraced, hiding from the wind behind a broad back. I am a traitor, sadly Pam said to herself, as she walked up the stairs, because that's something Oliver definitely can't be told. At home, she picked up the picture where she and Oliver stood, hugging, happy lovers. When he left for the army, Pam printed out the photo and framed it. It made her feel better. She even talked to Oliver while referring to this portrait. What had happened to them? Why had he changed so much, grown so cold? Of course, the army isn't a sports camp. It's a lot of work, but why does he not want to understand that she too is difficult and very lonely without him? She fell asleep to these thoughts and dreamed of a ribbon of highway running under her wheels, the wind and the river, taking away all her sorrows. In the morning, Andrew asked no questions, just a hum, appreciating her rested appearance and shining eyes. In the evening, he picked her up and they chatted for a while on the road nothing major. Weather, politics, favorite movies. Pam caught herself thinking she was beginning to get used to her driver and bodyguard in one. When questioned by the girls who noticed the same car coming to pick her up, there was no answer. Lily was the only one who seemed to know what it was all about and was clearly jealous. What did Pam not have time to hang out anyway? She started studying for her exams. She was also waiting for Alex Bagrov's next move. It happened at another premiere, where they went with him. The play was, as they say, for the select few. The production was in English and in some places. Seeing that his companion strained his memory, Bagrov translated in her ear replicas of the characters. There was nothing ostentatious, and Pam quickly ceased to be embarrassed. And at intermission, he took her hand in his and said, Pam, I ask you to be my wife. The girl froze, opening and closing her mouth. So unexpected was what was happening. Seeing her bewilderment, Bagrov grinned. 
an evening with candles, flowers, ring with champagne. And I was missing on one knee. Pam helped her head, picking up the flock of sparrows that had scattered. I don't like to look ridiculous, Bagrov continued. And my knee is badly bent. There's a prosthetic as a reminder of the past. So I just decided to ask if you agree to be with me. I'm old enough to be your father, and I understand that. But I can promise you that I can make you happy. Pam shook her head. She shook her head. She had a hard time with the phrase, but I can't. I'm waiting for my fiancé from the army. He proposed to you. And you said yes. You are engaged. Bagrov asked quickly. Pam didn't lie, shaking her head. Indeed, they hadn't made plans for the future. She was the one who decided for the two of them that it would be this way and not that way. And Oliver is less and less likely to get in touch, and he's doing the little talking in general. And in general, he behaves extremely strangely. If she tries to ask questions, he just shuts down. What if he's got another girl out there? So I have a chance, correctly regarded her silence. Bagrov summed up. And believe me, I'll take it to the full. Oliver dear, talk to me. Explain to me what's going on. Pam, over and over again hypnotized the phone, but the cell phone was silent and conversations were becoming more and more rare. And they talked about almost nothing. In sheer desperation, she even called Oliver's mother. He had left her this number just in case, but even this extreme measure did not bring clarity. Pam, I don't understand it either. Oliver's mother cried into the phone. It was as if the boy had been replaced. He used to be kind and affectionate, and now he's just making small talk. He hangs up on me at the drop of a hat. Time passed. Andrew still drove her and took her home from the institute, periodically replenishing the foodstuffs in the fridge. Oliver stopped writing altogether. He didn't answer the phone. A month passed. A second. Another time, calling her fiance's mother, as she had grown accustomed to counting. Pam heard that Oliver had decided to stay in contract service. Her mother was sodding so much that Pam could barely manage to calm her down. Looking at the picture of her and Oliver, the girl took it out of the frame and put it in the album. Life went on. And it was her life, which she wouldn't let anyone break. Especially since she certainly didn't feel abandoned now. Bagrov continued courting and did it unobtrusively, tried to please her pleasant little things. And twice they went for a night flight on a motorcycle. Pam listened carefully to Alex and found his big face not so repulsive. And more than once she'd noticed the envy in the women's eyes. Yes, we did not understand how this girl was able to rip off such a substantial sum. Bagrov himself became interested in some provincial girl. They appeared together more and more often, visiting exhibitions, theaters, fashionable movie premieres. Pam began to get used to this life, which before only in the movies and scene. It was easy and safe beside this, closed in a man doomed to tremendous power, but never once demonstrated that power to her, Pam. And then came the very evening when Andrew after the theater brought them not to Pam's house, but to a luxurious mansion in a prestigious area of the city. Looking at his kind, Pam always wondered, how much could such a house cost? I invite you to my place for a cup of coffee. Alex answered her silent question. I won't hide it. Yes, I'm looking forward to continuing the evening. However, everything depends on you. If you don't want to stay, Andrew will take you home. However, I do ask that you take a look at my bachelor pad. Inside, the bachelor pad turned out to be a dream home. It was elaborate. There was no sense of being a museum. It was really a dwelling designed for its occupants to enjoy life. Pam was particularly enthralled by the fireplace, already melted, filling the house with a lively warmth. Following her gaze, Bagrov nodded to the chair opposite the fireplace. Pam snuggled with pleasure, stretching her legs toward the fire. Kirill brought coffee, fruit and sweets, sat down on the floor covered with a fluffy carpet and carefully took off the girl's shoes. What are you doing? She was surprised. However, with a nonchalant look, he began to massage her feet. Pam purred with pleasure. 
Her whole being was filled with pure bliss. She longed for Alex to go on. Her body, which had not known a man's hands for so long, trembled with latent desire. Everything will be just the way you want it. He said softly, without interrupting his activity. I want you very much, you know that, but I will stop. If you say no, yes. Quietly Pam said. Everything that happened then surpassed her most secret dreams. Alex knew how to be passionate and gentle. Pam, quietly he said, looking into her eyes, glowing with pleasure. I'll repeat my proposal. Marry me. You can see that we're absolutely right for each other. And she answered yes again. The rest was like a fairy tale. They could have been married on the same day. So pervasive was Alex Bagrov's influence in this town. But Pam had requested at least a week to prepare. She wasn't going to throw a bachelorette party, knowing the girls would be jealous, which was the last thing she wanted. She just wanted to gather her thoughts, say goodbye to her old life, visit her parents after all. When her mother heard the news, she spluttered with her hands. My daughter, how can it be? He's a gangster, everyone knows that. Mom, it's all nonsense. If he's rich, then he's a gangster. Pam reassured her. Dad's usually so quiet, he just asked if you'll regret it later. I don't know. Dad, Pam confessed honestly. He does everything for me. Protects me like a treasure. But does he? My father did not give up. Pam waited. They had never said that word before. But what about Oliver? Pam's mother said, he doesn't write, he doesn't call. He doesn't write, he doesn't call. Pam admitted honestly. The parents looked at each other and sighed. Okay, daughter, you're a grown-up. You have your own head on your shoulders past the verdict of her father. No advice will not help. There is only one. Use your head and listen to your heart. Pam returned to town with mixed feelings. A worm of doubt gnawed at her from within. But she shook it off, thinking it was normal. Things would get better. She would become Pam Crimson. Her husband would cherish her. And Oliver, what could he do? She wasn't the first one to get dumped after all. The day on which the celebration was scheduled came so quickly that she simply didn't have time to recover her senses. Just yesterday she was sitting in her classes, taking her credits, and now she was standing in front of the mirror wearing a veil and a snow white dress, looking like a fairy tale princess. She looked in the mirror and saw a future life of beautiful, secure. Alex loves her and he's not that much older. If you look into it, it's even better to treat her like his favorite girl, to pamper her, to carry her in his arms. And he looks imposing. Women still look up to him. So the messages and calls were pouring in like an abundance. Pam had no idea she had so many friends and acquaintances eager to congratulate her on the occasion. When she had been a poor, humble Pam, there had been far fewer. Pam was about to turn off her cell phone when suddenly her eyes fell on a message that appeared on the screen. It was Oliver's mother. Her heart fluttered like a caught bird, and she read it. Pam, Oliver is hurt. He's dying. Not knowing what she was doing, Pam dialed the number. What happened? Where is he? A woman sobbing in her voice told her that her son had stayed behind after the army to serve under contract. He wanted to earn money for an apartment to give him and Pam a comfortable life. He had to serve in a hot spot and there was no way to call or write from there. Besides, the guy didn't want to worry his family. And now the scary thing happened. Pam stared at the silenced phone for a long time and then completely unaware of what she was doing took off her wedding dress, threw her veil on a chair, changed into jeans and a sweater, grabbed her purse, and headed out. All the rest was like a dream. She realized she was already on the train. She didn't even remember how she bought the ticket. What she said. The phone was left there next to the veil, which she never got a chance to try on. Along with them, she left all her past life. Already aware that there would be no way back, she walked swiftly down the white hospital corridor, looking at the room numbers. It seemed that she had to get here alive. And there she would manage. She would get him out, even from the other side of the world. She'll be there day and night. 
and then he'll get better. He'll definitely get better and everything will be fine. He will understand, forgive. And maybe he did not need to know about her affair with Bagruff. She thought that Oliver had left her. So she got confused. She got carried away. It didn't matter now, as long as he lived. Seeing the right number, Pam opened the doors of the room and immediately slammed them shut. Seeing a picture of the most intimate nature over the hospital bed, leaned a slim nurse in a white robe. She was standing with her back to her, but Pam realized that she was kissing the man lying on the bed. She looked again at the room member. It was correct. Shakily, the girl looked into the room again. Excuse me, I was told that Oliver was in this room. The nurse walked briskly past her with an independent look and an astonished voice was heard from the bed. Pam, why are you here? Pam leaned against the wall, feeling her strength leave her. Are you alive? Your mother called and said you were dying. This is a mistake. The other fighter, my father-in-law, got hit pretty bad. I took a bullet too, but I got off easy. I'm recovering now. Oliver's voice sounded guilty. He hid his eyes. I could tell you were getting better. Oliver turned away, and then he was quiet, and then he went on the attack. You mean Mary? You didn't. She followed me around like a little kid. Maybe that's why I got better. Did you think men were monks at war? We walk on the edge every day. While you're out there enjoying your lives as civilians, you're no saint yourself, I'm sure, for hiding your eyes, cheating on me. Pan was staring at him with her eyes wide open. It was a different Oliver, unfamiliar, spiteful, unpleasant. Yes, she answered. I was cheating on you. I was even going to get married today. And then she turned and ran away, swallowing back tears, hurt and disappointment. The door slammed behind her, cutting off another possibility of her fate never coming true. Pam returned to Dover, her eyes washed with time and tears. She was a young, healthy woman, and a well-nurtured woman. She is young and healthy, and somehow she can straighten out her life. And who's going to help her? Pam. Without looking, put her hand into her purse and pulled out some bills. She handed them to the old woman. Take it, Grandma. Be well. God give you health, good soul, and a good gentle husband, said the old woman. Pam could not stand it and burst into tears. The beggar woman groaned, sat down next to her, and stroked the weeping girl on the head, whispering something comforting. Cry, cry. Ditanka Tears Heart Cleanses, you won't believe me now, but your happiness is not far off. It will find you, don't doubt it. Fate will give you a sign soon. Don't miss it. Look, Pan was crying. She didn't listen to the words. She didn't even notice that the old woman had got up and walked away. And when she looked up, she was long gone. Pam, where did you come from? A noise came over her ear. The girl lifted her head and groaned, Polly, where did you come from? I came to see my aunt, laughed her former classmate. They had only studied together for a year. Then the cheerful, mischievous girl, who had come all the way from Siberia to receive an education, decided that years of poring over books was not for her, and quickly got married. They hadn't seen each other since, but Pam recognized her immediately. She was still the same perky, laughing girl. But she blossomed, she was prettier, and she obviously didn't need the money. And now she was staring at Pam with the same keen gaze. Have you been crying? Tell me what happened, Polly with an irrepressible tone said. She made it obvious she was used to being bossy. Pam hesitated for a few seconds, decided to tell her former classmate the whole story. You're really something, Polly said. I thought that only happened in books about movies. Why don't you go back to your biographer? She might forgive you, ashamed, Pam admitted. And then, remembering how cold Alex's eyes had grown at times, how determined he'd been in business, she lowered her head. No, she wouldn't. So she's ready to go wherever the hell she wants. Polly squinted, even to Siberia. Pam glanced at her, wondering if she was joking. But she looked serious. 
Well, I don't have a job in your line of work. You'll have to be a maid. My husband and I own a hotel with a good reputation. Business is good. I'll provide the lodging, food from the restaurant. Make up your mind. Are you coming? I'm coming, Pam said. Events unfolded with the swiftness of an unwinding spring. And now she really didn't care where she was going, as long as she stayed away from the two men she thought loved her and whom she loved. Pam, who'd grown up in a small country town and then plunged headlong into the hustle and bustle of the metropolis. She'd forgotten how friendly people-to-people -people relations could be and how unhurried life was. Of course, she was very worried about how she would be received, how she would settle in a new place. It turned out that all fears were unfounded. Oliver, Polly's husband, a big red-cheeked man with a booming bass and a thunderous laugh hugged her from the doorstep and said welcome to Mother Siberia. Nobody will hurt you here. And if they even look at you ask you, you tell me. I'll sort it out in a jiffy. She was given a much larger room than her old one with everything she needed. She quickly became acquainted with the hotel staff. The duties were not difficult, and the tenants were adequate. Polly's mother, who lived with them, also took a liking to her. True, in a separate annex, she was not an old woman. Loved books. She immediately started inviting her guests to her house for tea, to chat about novelties, to discuss films, and in general to talk about life. Slowly, the emotional storms subsided, and Pam notified her parents from a new phone that she was doing well. Strictly forbidden to give out the number to anyone with the help of Oliver raised his connections, she even managed to take a sabbatical from the Institute. And that made her happy. Still, she hoped to finish her education. But that would come later. For now, she just had to live, study, smile. She didn't have to beat herself up all the time. There was enough work to go around, though, so she didn't have to worry about it. Besides, Polly and Oliver did not leave her alone, invited her to visit, took her on picnics in the neighboring town for shopping. After a month, Pam began to feel as if she had known all these wonderful people for a long time, and the work was not burdensome, and it even pleased her. Wait, Pam, we will find you a Siberian, Oliver joked, and Polly shooed him away. Why are you picking on me? Let the girl forget how she escaped from the wedding and lost two men in one fell swoop. Pam guffawed, realizing he genuinely cared about her. Oliver's character was simple. It is difficult for a woman alone. So it is necessary to help introduce. Most of the guests were the same simple men who had been sent to the Siberian wilderness on business. Pretty blue-eyed maid really liked. However, she was not pestered, hands-free, as if she bore some trace of the former resentment, disappointment, prohibiting reproachment, or maybe Oliver had done something. He'd talked to the lovelorn. The contingent here was constant. The same ones came every year, so the locals already knew what to expect and from whom. Oliver, I've never met anyone like you before, and I don't want any worse, Pam said with a smile. Oliver straightened his already broad shoulders and looked triumphantly at his wife. You saw what husband you got. The tall Polly, who barely reached her behemoth on the shoulder, stood on tiptoe, ruffled his hair, and kissed him soundly. Watching them, Pam was a little envious. What a couple they were. How happy and easy they were to live, weren't they? Not like her. And she jinxed it. It's true what they say, don't complain about fate. Things could get a lot worse. Pam realized this one morning, when she felt a queasy sensation and not on a pretty morning. Why would that be? She asked herself. The food in the restaurant had always been like that Boldakov sturgeon of the same quality of the first. It is the latter, even to offend the majestic queen of the kitchen, with suspicions seemed to her a case of absolutely impossible. And then a sudden thought made her ouch clasping her mouth with the palm of her hand. It couldn't be. Or maybe she erupted, remembering the details of the one evening she had spent in bed with Bagruff. It had all happened so suddenly, but he had been so careful, so gentle. Maybe it was a mistake after all. The next morning, however, it was all over again. Seeing Pam as pale as Mel, Polly took her aside and asked, Head on, 
what was going on. Pam didn't hide her fears. And Polly said, you lucky mother, go to the hospital, let them take a look at you. The gynecologist confirmed it definitively and irrevocably. Pam was pregnant, asked her point blank if she wanted an abortion or if she wanted to have the baby. To a confused Pam, replied Polly, which staggered with her even into the doctor's office. This is usually not welcome, but too bad feeling, completely lost from the news dumped on her girl. Besides, in the town, it seems, everyone knew each other. We're going to have a baby. Give her something to keep her from throwing up. Vitamins or something. And then we'll figure it out. We can't raise the baby, can we? My mother took care of two. Now she's always talking about a third. Go on, Pam, get her a baby, or she'll have us all worried sick with all her fierce energy. She already had two boys running around that looked just like each other and their father. They were already tall, strong, mischievous, and very friendly. Their parents were incredibly proud of them, and everyone who worked at the inn spoiled them at every opportunity. Pam, too, was eager to slip them a present and often admired the boys, thinking that one day her son and daughter would be just as merry running around, poking their curious noses everywhere, and not be afraid of anything. Now the life of the very one was at stake, so many times imagined in her fantasies, and Pam made up her mind, repeating after Polly, I'm going to have the baby. I will. It seemed, after the difficult decision had been made, fate took pity on Pam. The toxicosis stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The hotel staff, and apparently not without the intervention of the hostess, surrounded Pam with care. She was not allowed to lift heavy things, her rest time increased in her diet, and the amount of fruits and vegetables increased dramatically. She was encouraged, joked good-naturedly about her gradually rounding tummy. They said, soon will be born the third giant, for nothing, Amy. The baby stared at her with his eyes as blue as his mother's and suddenly started humming, as if to confirm her words. The man gave his word. The big, pink-cheeked midwife, like almost all the locals, eagerly supported her and carried the baby away, letting the mother come to her senses. In the room, Pam was smiling too, feeling incredibly calm inside and confident that everything was going to be okay. At home she was welcomed, joyfully treated to a real celebration. She had long since moved into one of the cozy cottages built by the hard-working Oliver this year. He had long dreamed of enlarging the business, and just now he was considering an offer to join a large hotel chain as a partner. Pam, too, was not forgotten. At the family council, it was decided that, having recovered from the birth, she will take the place of the administrator. Education allows the work she knows. She wasn't going to be a maid forever. The days passed, filled with joy and happiness. The baby turned out to be quiet. He ate well, didn't molest her crying, and let her mother sleep at night. So Pam was quite able to go out for a few hours to work, to receive guests, whose flow did not stop regardless of the season. Of course, her friends didn't charge her a penny for her lodging. But Pam insisted on paying, and was very proud of her independence. One day Oliver said in all seriousness, Pam, you bring us back no differently. Things are going so well that I'm afraid to jinx it. Sometimes it seems that the men come to us just to see your blue eyes. Pam laughed, but there was some truth in the joke. Men of all ages were looking at her. More than once she received an invitation to spend the evening in a restaurant. Twice she immediately offered her hand and heart. She politely declined, citing the need to take care of her son. It was not that she had given up on herself, no, it was just that the memory of a double loss and double betrayal was too much alive. Exactly. She was sure she'd betrayed Alex without ever explaining to him what had happened and who had she stabbed him in the heart for. For a guy who'd traded their love for the first girl who'd shown him signs of affection. And yet, over time, Pam forgave Oliver by becoming a mother. She had changed inside, more empathetic and capable of forgiveness. The boy was wounded, didn't know if he would survive. And that nurse was there for him. 
She supported him, surrounded him with warmth, protected him. Can you blame him for being weak? There was only one person Pam didn't forgive. She forgave herself. She realized how unfairly she had treated Alex, how much she had hurt him. If she'd had her phone back, she might have tried to explain herself, but fate itself had decided otherwise. But she couldn't stop dreaming about him. Especially often reoccurring dream when they both raced on a motorcycle, and she was sheltered from the wind behind a broad back bag roof. She even woke up with the smell of leather jacket and with trails of tears on her cheeks. It would be necessary to prepare the guest house a bath to drown out of the treats there something, Oliver announced in the morning. You girls are in charge there. And I'll meet the guests. Is the inspector coming? Polly giggled. Take it from the top, Oliver joked. It seems that Tsar himself is coming to see us. What happened? Polly gasped. Oliver spat over his left shoulder three times, so as not to jinx it. I guess so. Otherwise he wouldn't have come. All right, girls, make sure everything is high class. We'll be there soon. Pam and her spouse's joy was transmitted. The merger had long been talked about, with high hopes and great prospects. As she understood from the conversations, the intended partner already had an established hotel business. Now he was interested in the outlying regions. The emphasis was on ecology, closeness to nature. The inhabitants of the capital, tired of the smog and the eternal rush, could have a rest here with pleasure. And the man, according to Oliver, was decent. He could have just taken over, offered a small portion of his generosity, but no. He called him for a partner, he listened to Oliver's opinion. So, at a distance, Pam already liked him. Though she didn't bother to ask who this unknown man was, Polly didn't seem to know either. Sensible, in general, Oliver still adhered to the rule that women should not be involved in purely male affairs. Leaving Timka in the care of Polly's mother, Pan was happy to get involved in the preparations for the meeting. And when the black car, escorted by Oliver's jeep, pulled up in front of the house, she had everything ready for one thing she was definitely not prepared for. That Alex Bagrov would get out of the car. Pam flailed around, looking for a place to hide. Blood rushed to her face. Her heart was pounding like crazy. It couldn't have been him. It didn't happen that way. And yet it was him. A gaunt, gaunt man, but definitely him. Pan ran to Polly's mother's outhouse, threw open the door, and rushed to the bewildered woman. Help, I need to leave now immediately. What's the matter? Polly's mother stroked her shoulders, trying to reassure her. Through her tears, Pam told her what had happened. Choking on her tears, stop it right now. You'll wake Timka, ordered the usually soft and good-natured woman. And Pam fell silent. I believe that this is a sign from above, she announced. You need to talk. Besides, he must know that he's become a father. You have no right to keep it from him. Han looked at her with wide eyes. What are you looking at? You think you'll always take it out yourself. Believe me, loneliness is or. Pam looked up at her landlady begrudgingly. She nodded. Sit down, I'll take care of this myself. And left. Pam listened to the voices huddling in her chair. And then the door fell open again. And Andrew walked in with Polly's protesting and kicking mother in his arms. He hadn't changed a bit, and still the same elusive smile played across his face. Hello, Pam, he pronounced, carefully, setting the mistress of the house on the floor. She shifted her gaze from one to the other, trying to come to her senses from the unexpected behavior of the named guest. Hello, Andrew. Pam looked up at him with tearful eyes and quietly asked Alex, does he know that I am here? No, to her surprise, Andrew answered and bent down to kiss the hand of Polly's dumbfounded mother. I'm sorry for my methods. I know Pam well enough and her ability to slip away. Don't worry, dear, no one wants to hurt her. On the contrary, what about it? Pam began, and then she stopped talking. She remembered the three-lettered book she'd seen once at Andrew's. There are no X's in that office. 
It's hard to imagine what kind of connections Alex Bagrov's driver and bodyguard could pull. You want to ask why we're here? Andrew guessed. Alex makes a deal profitable for both sides. Of course, I had to steer him a bit in search of a partner, but it's actually a great decision. Now you need to take yours and take my word for it. I won't let you hurt my friend's heart again. Andrew's face turned cold and serious. This is the first time Pam has seen him like this. So you have two ways. If you say that it is all over between you, and I have searched for you all this time for nothing, I will not say anything to Alex, and we will go away. Really, you'll have to move too, so you won't cross paths by accident from now on. I promise I'll help with that too. If you love him, go and tell him so. Otherwise, you'll be the biggest fool in the world. And I've seen a lot of them. Pam covered her eyes with her hands. She covered her eyes with her hands. She had already come to terms with it, believed that she would live for her son. And now fate had shuffled the cards again. Andrew found her. He is not worried about the owner, but for an old friend and for her worries. She could feel it perfectly well. And then there was a crying sound behind the wall. Andrew raised his eyebrows in amazement and looked at Pam demandingly. I have to go. Timka woke up. She explained and went to her son. Timka is what? What does that mean? Confused, Andrew repeated. He did not know about the baby. It turns out that even all the leading office is failing. Closing the door, Pam heard the voice of Polly's mother. Sit down at last. My tea is hot. I'll tell you what I know just promise not to grab me like that again. I will not vouch as it was pleasant. Calmly replied Andrew, to whom it seems to have returned to its former mood. Pan was nursing her son, rocking him in her arms, and contradictory feelings gripped her, one part of her longed to hide. The other part flew mentally toward Alex. Once again, fate intervened. The bell rang, and Oliver's cheerful voice said, Pam, come here, I'll introduce you to a wonderful man. The girl opened the door with such difficulty, as if she weighed a ton, if it were not for Andrew stepping beside her, she probably would have fainted from excitement. The voices faded and several pairs of eyes stared at her. And this is Pam, our friend and wonderful administrator. Oliver began and stammered at the sight of Alex slowly rising from the table. Bagrov was silent and looked at Pam. She had the strength not to look away. The pause was dragging on. What's going on, people? Oliver cut in again. Do you two know each other? They know each other. Andrew answered. They really need to talk alone now. Left alone with Alex, Pam shrank into a lump. What could she say to the man she had ruthlessly abandoned, betrayed? And yet she had the guts to exhale. One single word his name. Alex. He was silent, and Pam dared to look up. This stern, stricken man who had seen so much in his life was weeping. Tears were streaming down his sunken cheeks, and he was staring at her in tears. And then they spoke at the same time, interrupting each other, hurrying to tell each other how they had been living all this time and why they had only met now. Pam couldn't believe her ears. He knew why and who she'd run off to on her wedding day and took it for granted. Decided he was too old for her, that life's gifts were over, and just wished her happiness. He was used to losing this master of life, who was able to build his considerable fortune not on other people's bones and without quarreling with the law. He loved her so much that he let her go. And that was the most incredible thing. She talked about meeting him in the hospital, about how she regretted her own act a thousand times and how she decided it was her punishment for betraying him. They talked as if they had been silent for a thousand years and had never been able to cross the line, to embrace each other. And then the door opened and a hungry Timka cried in the silence. Andrew held him gently and awkwardly, as men do. Well, Tim, maybe you can at least explain to these nerds that it's time for them to kiss and start all over again, the three of us. When a completely dazed Bagrov took his son in his arms, it seemed to Pam that the house was brighter. It shone with genuine happiness. Alex's eyes. The wedding was played here. 
They had the perfect restaurant and banquet hall on hand. Pam looked stunning in white. It was Bagrov's insistence. She cried for joy. Mom, who got a son-in-law and grandson at the same time. Drunken father instructed Oliver, and Andrew the great combinator, bodyguard driver, and trusted friend. Sitting next to Polly's mother, rejuvenated, slender, and very elegant. Every now and then stroking her hand. Who knows? Polly said thoughtfully, looking at the picture. Maybe one wedding won't be enough. We live in Siberia. Everything is big here, with heart and soul, Oliver confirmed. Pam didn't hear the conversation. She was sitting beside her husband. She could not eat or drink, but she felt good and relaxed, as she had felt on the motorcycle, behind the strong and mighty back of the man she loved.